Well, hello, I'm Janet Morana, Executive Director of Priest for Life. Welcome to Just Ask Janet. Well, very often uh, when moms are expecting a baby and the couple is so excited, but during the course of the pregnancy, there's a lot of tests these doctors like to perform, as you know, blood work and ultrasounds and all kinds of tests. And sometimes, very often, it's around the second trimester, uh, they might get a diagnosis that there's something wrong with your baby. Um, in today's program, we're going to talk about one of those cases. It's called trisomy 18. And unfortunately, many medical doctors out there, when they get this diagnosis, they counsel the mom to terminate, which means have an abortion. And we know by experience, both with the women we've spoken to who have not taken the doctor's advice and have given birth to these children. And also I know from the silent and awareness campaign, women who did get such pressure from the medical community, they agreed to the termination, AKA abortion. And they said that the trauma they went through from that abortion and the guilt that somehow now they felt part of the destruction of that baby's life uh, was unbearable. And of course they eventually sought healing from that and, and, and now speak publicly. Don't do this. It's not the answer. Well, joining me on today's program is a wonderful woman. Her name is Elizabeth Leon, and I'm going to read a little bit of her bio. She's a Catholic wife, mother, author, and speaker from Ashburn, Virginia. She's been a leader in ministry and faith formation for more than 25 years and inspires others to find freedom and healing in Christ through her speaking and writing. Her gift is her willingness to be vulnerable and love with a heart wide open, despite the brokenness of divorce, adultery, death, and sexual abuse. She and her husband, Ralph, are the parents of 10 children, five are hers, four are his, and of course, their son that we're going to talk about today, John Paul Raphael, who died in 2018 from trisomy 18. So Elizabeth, welcome to the program. Hi, Janet. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, it's my pleasure. And I'm going to tell our viewers that partway through the program, we're going to show a little clip of the mm -hmm. birth uh, and the short life of your son, John Paul Raphael, mm -hmm. so they can see the, how wonderful and, and nurturing that, that special time was. But mm -hmm. let's, let's go back for a moment uh, to the pregnancy mm -hmm. and tell us when, when in the course of the pregnancy did you find out about John Paul's diagnosis? Sure. Well, my husband and I um, are both a second marriage, and I was of advanced maternal age already when I got pregnant. Um, so at the age of 45, we knew we wanted to have genetic testing done for the sake of information. My husband's a family physician, and we're both of the mindset that the more information you can have, the more prepared you can be to advocate and make good medical and spiritual decisions. So we had the NIPT testing, the non-invasive prenatal testing done at 14 weeks. And those results came back pretty quickly um, with an 87.7% chance that our son had trisomy 18. And, and explain to our, our people here, trisomy 18, exactly what does this mean? Sure. So trisomy 18 is one of a spectrum of genetic conditions where every cell in the child's body, just through a fluke, um, a fluke mutation, ends up having three copies, hence the trisomy of the 18th chromosome. There are three more common trisomies. Trisomy 21 is known as Down syndrome. Trisomy 13 is also um, one that we hear about somewhat. And then trisomy 18 is sometimes called Edwards syndrome. Um, and trisomy 18 and trisomy 13 are called by the medical community incompatible with life because these babies almost universally either die in the womb or die shortly after birth. Um, you know, we as a pro-life community, I, I take issue with the term incompatible with life because at the time that we were given the diagnosis, our son, John Paul Raphael, was already alive in my womb. So we've called it a life-limiting diagnosis. That's right. And, and of course, you know, when you said they live just a few days, um, there's also a little bit of board or spectrum as to how long these babies can live. I don't mm -hmm. know if you're familiar with uh, Senator Rick Santorum and his wife, Karen, uh, and their daughter, who has uh, Bella, 
who was born mm -hmm. with trisomy 18. I mean, I believe she just celebrated her, I, I lose track now. I think it's 11th or 12th birthday mm -hmm. in May. Uh, yes. And so, so Bella is like, I think almost like a record breaker uh, with uh, trisomy 18. I, I don't think I've heard of a, of a baby with trisomy 18 living quite that long. Uh, yeah. And when you listen to the Sun Terms talk about Bella, it's nothing but it's not a burden to the family. I know she mm -hmm. requires a lot of extra care, uh, mm -hmm. obviously. Um, but I mean, you could just Google her, her you know, Bella Centurum, and you'll see pictures of her. She looks cute yeah. as a button, uh, and she's an integral part of her family. So I always say, like, I, I hate that phrase too, incompatible with life. That's like, ugh. Um, but, you know, when you listen to even the Centaurums, this child has brought nothing but joy to their family. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But let's go back, you know, to, to your experience now. So you, now you get the diagnosis. So like you sure. said, 87% sure. chance that yep. this is a correct diagnosis. So mm -hmm. how did you deal with it from that point forward in the rest of the pregnancy? Sure. Well, there was a huge amount of grief, um, a, a, a large grieving process that my husband and I went through. And our doctor, well, the, the specialist where we had the testing done, they did immediately offer termination. I will say very gently. Um, and we said, no, not only we didn't, do we not want it, we want it never to be mentioned again. Please make a note on our file so that that conversation is not one you need to return to. And we were fortunate to have um, my obstetrician who had delivered my other children. It was the only pro-life Catholic family practice for um, pregnancy in Northern Virginia. So we knew that our doctor would be on board throughout the pregnancy to support our decision. Um, and at that point, one of the things they proposed was to have an amniocentesis done to confirm the diagnosis, which we declined um, for two main reasons. One, having the amnio inherently places a risk to the child in the womb. So uh, we did not need to have any extra risk to John Paul just to have the certainty of what his diagnosis was because we were gonna love and welcome his life no matter how long or short it was. So it didn't change our decision, but more, an amnio would not answer the question I most wanted to know, which is not just did he have this condition, but how are we going to get through this? How are we going to survive loving and losing a baby that we desperately wanted? Yeah. Well, <clears throat> you know, I've, uh, I guess, fortunate, unfortunate, because of my work here at Priest for Life, I have had a lot of experience with other couples who've gone mm. down this road. Um, and recently there was another couple, it was a little bit over a year ago, uh, and actually at one time he had worked for Priest for Life, he and his wife now live in Texas. Mm -hmm. And um, it was, their whole, was just like you, where they were saying um, we could do more tests. They said, no, we're not gonna have an amniocentesis right. because whatever it is, it, it is. But it's funny, they, they still did a lot more, um, evaluation of their baby mm -hmm. to say, well, mm -hmm. um, his kidneys aren't, aren't functioning or this isn't happening. And, and so when he's born, they, they were painting like this whole long laundry list of all these things are probably what's going to happen, which is why he won't live too long. Did they begin mm -hmm. to give you those kind of like markers of, as to what was going on? Yes, absolutely. We actually had extensive ultrasounds, um, we had fetal echoes of the heart. We actually saw a, a world-renowned fetal cardiologist at Children's Hospital in DC, really from the point of view that we needed to know everything else that was going on with our son to be able to give him the best possible chance of living. Trisomy 18, we couldn't fix. We could not change the outcome of what that would be. But if he had um, one common side effect is called a tracho tracheoesophageal fistula, where there's a break in the trachea, you can fix that. Or if there was a heart defect, you can fix that. So if John Paul had turned out to be one of those really lucky children like Bella Santorum, whose life extended past a certain period of time, there could have been medical conditions that we would have done medical intervention for. But those would be different than simply trisomy 18 because you can't change the cells or the DNA in his body. Um, the condition that he ultimately would die from was not fixable. 
Right. And, and, and so what, I mean, were there a certain, in other words, getting ready for his birth, were they going mm -hmm. to have certain specialists standing by or, and were you guided into like, okay, we're going to let the pregnancy go till this point and then maybe then do the season? Like what was, how did all sure. that come together? You know? Sure. Well, with trisomy 18, it's really a balancing act because with any baby, you want to keep them in their safe environment as long as possible. So by 30 weeks, I was having weekly ultrasound and doing growth scans. And as long as he was growing in my womb, we know we knew he was still doing well. At the point that he stopped growing, we knew then we would have to intervene, intervene. And we were blessed that he continued to grow until 35 weeks. Um, and at that point, we got the news that he had not gained any weight within the last week or two weeks. We were well prepared with a birth plan and we had so many professionals supporting us throughout the process from palliative care, hospice care, of course, the obstetricians, the maternal fetal specialists. There were just so many people that provided us support. Um, and our birth plan was very clear that we did not want Don Paul taken to the NICU. Um, if he presented with trisomy 18, which we were expecting, we wanted to simply love and embrace his life as it was going to unfold. It got a little bit tricky, though, because I had a lot of complications myself with a condition called polyhydramnios. Um, and ultimately, we ended up with a cesarean section, a, a, a very dramatic emergency cesarean. But one of the questions we had was we did not want him put on a ventilator because, as I said before, that wasn't going to solve the problem of his trisomy 18. But if I had been knocked out completely with anesthesia, did we want to put him on a ventilator until I woke up from the anesthesia so at least I could meet him? So it got very complicated at the end, trying to balance um, dignity and quality of life for John Paul with all the variables that we had no way to predict could be present. Wow. So in the end, um, I mean, I, you did a beautiful video, which in, in a few minutes, we'll share a few minutes of that. Mm -hmm. Um, but I saw you were awake during the birth. So I'm guessing you must have had some sort of, you didn't get general anesthesia, you must have had like a spinal or something like that mm -hmm. to, do what, to do the C-section, correct? Mm -hmm. So correct. that was, that was the final <laughs> decision. Mom wanted mm -hmm. to stay awake. I mean, and this whole question to put him on the ventilator or not, I mean, I, I guess that must have been a difficult decision too, because um, what would the ventilator have done really at that point? Um, Correct. They thought he was going to pass away anyway in a very short mm -hmm. period of time. Mm -hmm. So it would have really interrupted that kind of quality bonding yeah. time that like that was so important. I saw you had that skin to skin time with him a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, that's mm -hmm. so important when babies are first born and yeah. then your husband was there. Um, you know, but this must have been all heart wrenching for you too. I mean, to, to have to, you know, what can you say to other people right now who might be struggling with these kind of decisions? Cause you know, unfortunately you were blessed to have a very, very good, um, medical team there. Mm -hmm. But I've heard some horrible stories, uh, Elizabeth, where these doctors, they just keep using that phrase, incompatible life, incompatible life. And right. I, one couple told me that she finally, the, her and her husband, she said, she they stood up and they went like this to the doctor. Doctor, we don't kill our babies. Get it? Yeah. No yeah. more talk about that now. Yeah, um, very clear. You know, and, and so, you know, you really were, I guess, blessed in a way mm -hmm. to have such a supportive team all around you, right? Mm -hmm. We absolutely were blessed. Um, not just from the standpoint of having our own ability to educate ourselves. Like I said, my husband's a doctor and we, we had a lot of ability to research and find the information we need, but we were surrounded and we also chose, we chose to surround ourselves with people, with professionals that would only share our we're willing to share our mindset and we were very clear in the hospital as well um, of what what our preferences were and what we needed um there really is such a challenge because when you're living in the land of uncertainty i mean essentially when you get an adverse prenatal diagnosis you're choosing a path you know will end in suffering 
Um, and as Catholics, of course, we know uh, this is a valley of tears. Our, we are never promised a life without suffering. But to choose that path deliberately by not going down the easy route of abortion is very, very challenging because your inclination when you live in uncertainty is to do something, to do anything. And, and I'm convinced with great compassion that that's how women end up making the painful and tragic decision to end their baby's life because without support, sitting in that place of uncertainty and suffering is, is nearly unbearable. So they do the only thing they know how to do. Um, and for us, with so much support, I really was still desperate at times to do something. I mean, I went through a period of grief after John Paula had died where I was very angry at my husband for somehow convincing me that it was reasonable not to put him on a ventilator, which was of course the right decision. But when you play it through in your head, you love your baby so much and you just miss them. And you think, why didn't we do more? And reality is we did everything we could to provide him with a beautiful, love-filled life for as many minutes as we were given. Um, and I can't ask the I can't answer the question for why God didn't give us more, but all I can say is that in that struggle of uncertainty, when we invited the Lord into that and agreed to do it His way, to submit and surrender to His plan for our son, He flooded in. He filled us with grace. He filled us with hope. He filled us with the people we needed around us to hold us up when we couldn't hold ourselves up anymore. Right. Well, you know, uh, now you mentioned that that whole ventilator thing. This other family I was referring to, um, what they what ha ended up happening with them is their little one took a turn for the worse very quickly, mm -hmm. but all the other children were there, yeah. Yeah. just as mom and dad were. Mm -hmm. So the doctors quickly said, "I'll tell you, you know what we'll do? We'll put him on, uh, like we'll bag him to keep him mm -hmm. alive for a little while longer because he's he's mm -hmm. he's going quick." So while they, the grandmas quick ran and got all the kids and brought them all to yeah. the hospital. And, and then they got to, then as soon as they got there, everyone assembled and the priests came, like you said, they got mm -hmm. the sacraments, everything. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> then they took them off the vent and everyone had that last <clears throat> mm -hmm. <laughs> few minutes to, to hold that baby. Yeah. Um, and that makes so much sense because then the intervention is to improve the whole family's quality of life and the family's right. experience experience of loving and losing this beautiful child. I can understand why they would make that decision. Well, I know your family did a great uh, video. It's up on YouTube. Um, mm -hmm. So let's just, we took a little clip of that. Let's take a look of John Paul Raphael right now. Mm. This is John Thank Paul Raphael. <laughs> he made it. Thank you all. Now. Thank you all for being so supportive and helpful.
Wow. <laughs> I mean, I get all teary eyed, Elizabeth, just, you know, I, I've mm -hmm. seen the whole, whole video. Uh, for the brothers and sisters, if you want, it is on YouTube. I think if you Google uh, John Paul Raphael, it'll come up. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I found very interesting, Elizabeth, that you calculated exactly how many minutes mm -hmm. your son lived. Tell, tell mm -hmm. us about that. 1,690 minutes. Yes. Um, yes. Tell, he tell us how, how it came about that and, and the significance <laughs> of counting those every precious mm -hmm. moment so to speak. So tell us about Every that. precious moment. You are absolutely right. Every precious moment. Um, he died after 28 hours and 10 minutes. And I can remember there was this point in the hospital after he had died. Um, I think he was still with us. He stayed with us for another 22 hours in the hospital room after he had passed. And it was my first grappling with God of what meaning or purpose could this possibly be? And I remember looking up like, is there a a special meaningful Bible verse that's 2810, or I thought maybe there'll be a special number. So we did all the math and we added up the minutes to 1,690. And I tried to just dig and find some kind of significance to that number that would be God's message to me, right? That Elizabeth, this is why he only had this many minutes. And there was no magic number other than that number itself has become very precious to us. And we're so, so grateful. I mean, it's never enough. People that lose their children in their 30s or their 40s or their 50s, it's, you can never say you've had enough time with your child. You always desperately want more. Um, and we cling to that number. 1,690 minutes of total joy um, was such a gift and a blessing. And, and, you know, I did see that your other children were there. Tell us about mm -hmm. their whole reaction. Did they all get to hold John Paul? And just give us the little family, family dynamic there. Sure, um, absolutely. Well, we laughed and laughed before we got pregnant because for years um, our kids lived in fear that we would have another baby. <laughs> and so when I actually was pregnant, they really had a very mixed reaction. Um, we had one child say, I hate this baby already. We had a couple that would have nothing to do with it. We had two or three that were just shared all of our joy and excitement. But what we found was such a miracle. When John Paul was here, all eight of the eight of the nine of them were able to be present and hold and love him. Our one daughter was snowed in in Virginia Beach of all places and could not get up 95. It, John Paul was born in the middle of a deep freeze and a, a blizzard on the eastern seaboard. But they were transformed. I mean, there's this moment in the video where Ralph unwraps John Paul's blankets and you just hear this chorus of little voices go, oh, and you just hear them falling in love with him. One daughter in particular, she was going through a very challenging season with her own mental health at the time. Um, and one of the biggest challenges of our pregnancy was the fear of losing John Paul at any moment. He could have died in my womb. We were also really struggling to keep that daughter alive. So we had this deep fear that we had two children that were very much at risk during that season. And she fell in love with her little brother and held him and loved on him and took videos of him. And I truly believe that his intercession for her in heaven is what has turned her life around. Wow. Beautiful. And of course, Elizabeth, you have written a book in a few minutes that are left. Tell us about the book and when it's coming out and how people can obtain a copy. Yes, thank you. Well, this is really an obedience to the Lord. Um, after John Paul died, we had a beautiful mass of Christian burial for him a few days later. And I felt this call in my heart that I wanted to speak at the mass because so few people had an opportunity to meet him. And we just felt so convicted that we wanted to share something of the wisdom or the purpose that we'd gleaned from his life. Um, and I went to our adoration chapel the night before we buried him late in the at night and sat there with my laptop and just begged the Lord just to give me, Holy Spirit, give me your words. What can we possibly say about our beautiful son and his short and shining life? And the Lord gave me two phrases that day, one of which has truly become my mission. The first was, the miracle that you get is not always the miracle that you pray for. So John Paul was a miracle. His life was a miracle. But the miracle was not that he lived and stayed with us to live a long life. The second phrase that the Lord gave me was, let yourself be loved. 
because John Paul was adored. He was showered with love in only 28 hours and 10 minutes, this beautiful, tiny little four pound baby that, you know, had funny little ears and wasn't perfectly formed, but none of that mattered. He just was a gift from God and we loved him simply for who he was and his presence in our life. And I heard the Lord say to me and to all of us that that is his call, his invitation for us to let ourselves be loved. And it took the suffering of losing my son to really break my own heart open so that God's love and freedom for yeah, me so and joy. Just tell us quickly how they can get the book. Sure, absolutely. The book will be available from Kohler Books beginning January 4th. You can find it also on my website, elizabethleon.org. Okay, Let yourself well, be thank, loved. Thank you for such a powerful witness. God bless you and your family. And brothers and sisters, thank you for joining us on Just Ask Janet. I hope you found this story really inspiring, but also informative. Until next time, I'm Janet Morena, Executive Director of Priest for Life. God bless. I will be silent no more.